you're sitting in your basement surrounded by blue drums and expensive equipment. The 55-gallon water drums line the wall like sentinels guarding your survival. Your ceramic gravity filter, the $300 one with five-star reviews, sits on the shelf. You bought it after reading independent lab tests and survival forums at 2 a.m. You watched videos where people filter swamp water and drink it, grinning confidently. You believe you've solved the most critical survival problem, clean drinking water. But water is alive with microscopic organisms that don't care about your preparations. In week three, that ceramic filter will betray you in ways you cannot see. This is about the moment your careful preparation transforms into your execution chamber. This is about micro cracks invisible to eyes, cross-contamination at molecular levels, and chemicals degrading. This is about the microscopic gap that exists between filtered and actually safe. That gap is measured in microns, and inside it, pathogens are building colonies. Those colonies will be building inside your intestines before you realize the danger. Your ceramic filter operates on a brutally simple principle that seems foolproof initially. The ceramic material is porous at microscopic levels, creating a maze for molecules. Water molecules are tiny enough to pass through the microscopic ceramic maze easily. Bacteria, most species of them, are simply too large to follow water through the barrier. The pore size on quality ceramic filters typically ranges from 0.2 to 0.9 microns. Escherichia coli bacteria measure approximately 2 microns in length, too large to pass. Giardia cysts range from 8 to 12 microns in diameter, easily blocked. These organisms get trapped by the ceramic barrier like prisoners behind microscopic bars. You pour in brown water that looks like liquid earth from a contaminated source. You collect clear water that sparkles in your cup, looking perfectly safe to drink. You believe you're drinking. Safety. But the reality is far more complex and dangerous. But the marketing materials never tell you about the limits of ceramic filtration technology. Viruses are not bacteria, and this distinction will kill you if you forget it. Norovirus particles measure just 0.03 microns in diameter, far smaller than filter pores. Hepatitis A measures only 0.027 microns, passing through ceramic like ghosts through walls. Rotavirus clocks in at 0.075 microns, still small enough to bypass ceramic filtration. These viral particles pass through your expensive filter without ever touching the sides. The filter was never designed to stop them, but nobody tells you that. But the real killer isn't what the filter can't do in perfect condition. The real killer is what happens when the filter breaks and you don't know. Water expands when it freezes, and this is physics, not opinion or theory. When water transitions from liquid to solid, it expands by approximately 9%. If your ceramic filter gets wet and then freezes, even one single time, disaster begins. The water trapped inside the ceramic pores expands as it turns to ice. That expansion creates micro cracks in the ceramic matrix that you cannot see with eyes. These cracks are thinner than human hair, but catastrophic to your water safety. To bacteria, these invisible cracks are highways leading straight into your drinking water. E. coli bacteria that should be blocked now flow through the compromised structure freely. Cryptosporidium osis, measuring four to six microns, slide through the damaged ceramic barrier. You're still pouring dirty water into the top chamber like you always have. You're still getting clear water out of the bottom chamber that looks perfectly normal. The filter looks exactly the same as the day you first pulled it out. But now you're drinking water containing fecal coliform bacteria at 10,000 colony forming units. That concentration is equivalent to raw sewage, just diluted and clarified visually. The filter still removes sediment and larger particles that make water look dirty. It still makes the water look clean and safe enough to drink without concern. But clear and safe are not the same word, and your body knows the difference. Your intestinal lining will learn that painful difference in 12 to 48 hours. In timeline 14A, there are seven people sheltering together in a suburban house after the collapse. They pooled their resources before the grid went down, thinking cooperation ensured survival. They have four weeks of stored food and a high-end ceramic gravity filter system. The filter sits prominently on the kitchen counter where everyone can access it easily. Clean water comes out of the spigot, at the bottom into their bottles and pots. 
On day 11, someone fills a cooking pot with filtered water to make rice. The pot is resting on the counter right beneath the spigot during the filling process. The spigot touches the outside of the pot for less than three seconds total. Nobody notices the brief contact because they're tired and it seems insignificant at the moment. The outside of that pot was used two days earlier to collect rainwater. The rainwater came from gutters that were contaminated with bird feces and organic debris. Bird feces contain Campylobacter bacteria at concentrations of up to 1 million organisms per gram. The spigot is now contaminated with bacteria, and it will contaminate everything it touches. Every person who fills their water bottle from that spigot over 36 hours drinks contamination. On day 13, one person develops severe diarrhea and can't keep any food down. It's norovirus, which has an infectious dose of fewer than 20 viral particles total. In a house with functioning plumbing and hand sanitizer and Lysol, norovirus means misery. In a grid-down scenario with no running water, norovirus becomes a mass casualty event. The infected person produces billions of viral particles in every bout of vomiting and diarrhea. They're desperately trying to stay clean, but there's no running water for proper hand washing. The bathroom has transformed into a biohazard zone that contaminates everyone who enters it. By day 15, three more people are symptomatic with the same violent gastrointestinal symptoms. Norovirus causes projectile vomiting and explosive diarrhea that dehydrates victims with terrifying speed. An infected person can lose one full liter of fluid every two hours. In a hospital, they would receive intravenous rehydration and electrolyte replacement therapy immediately. In this house, they're trying to drink their stored water but can't keep anything down. By day 17, the first person is in hypovolemic shock from catastrophic fluid loss, their blood pressure is crashing because their blood volume is dropped by 30%, their kidneys are shutting down from lack of blood flow and filtration capacity. By day 18, that first person is dead from complications of severe dehydration. By day 20, four of the original seven people are dead in the house. The remaining three survivors are so dehydrated they can barely move or think clearly. The 55-gallon drums are still full of water sitting against the basement wall. The ceramic filter still works perfectly for its intended purpose of removing sediment, but cross-contamination killed them faster than thirst ever could have killed them. In Timeline 77X, he's alone in a rural cabin, 30 miles from the nearest town or neighbor. He has three months of food and 200 gallons of stored water. He has a propane camp stove with four canisters of fuel for cooking and boiling. His primary water treatment method is boiling, which he trusts completely and uses daily. Boiling works reliably when done correctly, bringing water to a rolling boil for one minute. That process kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria, viruses, and parasites in the water. It's the gold standard of water treatment used for thousands of years successfully. For the first three weeks, he boils every single drop of water he drinks. Each canister of propane lasts approximately five days when used exclusively for boiling water. On day 22, he lights the last canister and realizes his fuel miscalculation. He does the math and realizes he has 78 more days until food runs out. He has five days of fuel left, and the panic sets in like ice water. He remembers the backup plan he created months ago when he was thinking clearly. In the storage closet, he has two gallons of household bleach for emergency water treatment. Bleach is sodium hypochlorite, typically at 6% concentration in household products sold nationwide. Eight drops of 6% bleach per gallon of water will disinfect it in 30 minutes. He pulls out the first jug and prepares to treat his first gallon of water. The label says it was manufactured 18 months ago, but he doesn't think about it. He adds eight drops to a gallon of water, following the instructions he memorized. He waits the recommended 30 minutes and then drinks the water, feeling relieved and smart. What he doesn't know is that sodium hypochlorite degrades over time in the bottle. At room temperature, household bleach loses approximately 20% of its chlorine per year. After 18 months, his 6% bleach is now approximately 3.7% effective concentration. The eight drops he added are no longer sufficient to kill resistant pathogens. He's drinking water that's been partially treated, which is sometimes worse than untreated water. The chlorine killed the weakest organisms, but left the resistant ones to multiply. Chlorine-resistant cysts of Cryptosporidium survived the inadequate treatment 
and entered his intestines. Cryptosporidium has a thick outer wall, making it 10 times more resistant to chlorine. On day 28, the cramps begin in his lower abdomen with increasing intensity. Cryptosporidiosis causes watery diarrhea that can last for weeks without proper medical treatment. He's losing three liters of fluid per day through diarrhea, which is catastrophic. He tries to drink more water to compensate for the fluid loss from diarrhea, but he's still using the degraded bleach, not understanding why he's getting sicker daily. He's reinfecting himself with every cup of inadequately treated water he drinks desperately. On day 35, he's too weak to stand or even crawl to the door. The cabin is surrounded by a freshwater stream just 50 yards from his door. The propane is gone, the bleach is worthless, and he's too weak to act. He doesn't have the strength to build a fire to boil water anymore. He dies of dehydration within sight of running water, killed by chemical degradation. The survival mantra is not, have a filter or any single solution to water. The survival mantra is, have a system with failure nodes you actually understand completely. Layer 1. Calcium Hypochlorite Stop storing liquid bleach as your primary chemical treatment option for long-term survival scenarios. Liquid sodium hypochlorite degrades predictably over time, losing effectiveness you can't see or measure. Calcium hypochlorite, also known as pool shock, does not degrade like liquid bleach does in storage. Pool shock is a dry granular powder, typically 65 to 75% available chlorine. Stored in a cool, dry place away from moisture, it remains effective for years. One pound of 65% calcium hypochlorite can treat approximately 10,000 gallons of water. The mixing ratio is approximately one teaspoon per five gallons of water for treatment. You mix a small amount with water to create a chlorine solution first. Then you add that solution to your drinking water in the proper measured amounts. This is your long-term chemical treatment option that won't fail you after 18 months. This is what you use when the propane is gone and boiling is impossible. Layer two, pre-filtration. Never put turbid, sediment-filled water directly into your expensive ceramic filter without pre-filtering first. Sediment clogs the microscopic pores and accelerates wear, shortening the filter's effective lifespan dramatically. Use a pre-filter made of cloth, coffee filters, or even layered sand and gravel. Remove the visible particles first before they ever reach your primary filtration system. Then send the pre-filtered water through the ceramic filter for pathogen removal. This simple step extends the life of your primary filter by months or even years. Layer three, know your filter's limits. Ceramic filters do not remove viruses, and this limitation will kill you if forgotten. If you're filtering water that could contain human sewage, you absolutely need secondary treatment. Boil the filtered water after it comes through the ceramic filter for complete safety, or add chlorine after filtering to kill the viruses that pass through the ceramic. Never trust a single layer of defense when your life depends on water safety. Layer four, test for micro cracks. If your ceramic filter has ever frozen, even once, you must test it before use. Fill the upper filter chamber with water like you would for normal filtration. Add food coloring to the water in the upper chamber and let it filter through. If the output water is tinted at all, the filter is compromised and must be discarded. Discarded immediately without hesitation because your life is worth more than $300. Layer five, boiling as last resort, not first. Boiling is the single most reliable method of water treatment that exists today, but it requires fuel and fuel is finite in any long-term survival scenario. Use boiling when chemical treatment or filtration has failed or when you have uncertain water sources. Use boiling when you're treating water from a source you absolutely do not trust at all. But don't make it your primary method unless you have an unlimited fuel source available. Layer six, storage rotation. Stored water doesn't stay sterile forever, even in sealed containers in the dark. Every six months, dump your stored water completely and refill with fresh water. Add two drops of unscented bleach per liter when you refill opaque storage containers. This prevents bacterial growth during storage that could sicken you before crisis even begins. Layer seven, cross-contamination protocol. Treat your filter spigot like a surgical instrument in an operating room at all times. Never let it touch anything, not containers, not counters, not your hands unnecessarily. 
Never fill a container by touching the spigot to the rim of the container. Hold the container underneath and let the water flow in without any physical contact. Wipe the spigot with a chlorine solution after every single use without exception. One moment of carelessness creates a contamination cascade that kills every person in your group. Water is not a prep you complete and then forget about for years. Water is a living system you maintain, test, and rotate constantly until you die. The collapse won't announce itself with sirens and warnings on your phone screen. The grid won't fail on a convenient Tuesday when you're mentally prepared and supplies organized. It will fail when your ceramic filter has a hairline crack you can't see. It will fail when your bleach is 18 months old and you forgot to replace it. It will fail when you're exhausted and you let the spigot touch that dirty pot. And when it fails, biology doesn't negotiate with you or accept your excuses. Bacteria don't care about your intentions or how much money you spent on gear. Viruses don't pause their replication because you're a good person trying your best. Physics will kill you with the same indifference it shows a stone falling into water. Your move is to understand the failure points before they understand and exploit you. Your move is to build redundancy into every single layer of your water system. Your move is to test, maintain, and rotate your systems like your life depends on them. Because your life does depend on them, and physics doesn't give second chances to anyone. The collapse won't kill you when the lights go out or the trucks stop rolling. Physics will kill you. Three weeks later, when you trust a cracked ceramic filter.